Hello, everyone. Happy Wednesday. We're at Coffee with Carrie. Uh, welcome. So you throw questions at me about funeral directing, embalming, whatever it deals with in the death realm. If you have questions for me personally about what I do or anything, throw those at me. Just got back. So Wednesdays, I usually drop my kids off, get home, and I jump right into this. So anybody else roll through the children drop off line at school, thumping Old Town Road? Just me? Yeah, my kids are obsessed right now with Old Town Road. Who else knows that song? Seriously, it's repeat, repeat right now. No idea. So last yesterday, I received a phone call, um, which was pretty amazing. So I want to share with you guys about it. Using my K mug today. Woo! Lots of K's. Hey, everyone. Good morning. Um, JW, you made it this week. I know you posted, I think it was last week you posted you were out doing something so that you're back. Uh, good morning from Phoenix. I'm going to hopefully be in Phoenix this year too. So heads up with that. Um, so I get a lot of really amazing emails from people telling me about fears of death and fears of cemeteries and funeral homes and situations they've gone through in the past. And I get these great emails and people tell me that they've sought information from my channel or from online anywhere. And they've just found some solace, some peace, some resolve in their life from listening to the content and understanding the process more. And that they're in a better place, a different place. It's so amazing to hear that. Well, yesterday I had a woman call me um, and she is a uh, friend of a friend. So I've met her in person and she called me to apologize because when we met in person, I told her what I did, had kind of the same Ooh, reaction that a lot of people do. Doesn't phase me really much anymore. Um, and she shared with me the story of how her dad died when she was really young. And she is, it's kind of almost like a PTSD guys. When you go through a funeral and it's not a positive experience, you're very traumatized from it. And it's not just the death, it's the whole experience. So she has lived her life into her 40s, late 40s, with this fear. And she went and started watching my videos, and she has found this peace from it. And yesterday, she went and walked through a cemetery with her dogs and just, you know, and went into a space that she's not been comfortable. And she said, I was comfortable. And it's amazing that I had this breakthrough. And I don't know what it was that clicked, but so she wanted to share that with me. So for me to hear that verbally from somebody was really powerful for me because what I do takes time, uh, it takes energy. It takes me away from my kids sometimes. It takes me away from my family and I'm trying to pour in and it's amazing to hear back um, these stories. So keep sharing them with me. Um, if anything I've done has made a positive impact on you, just share, please. It really keeps me going. It keeps me motivated. It touches me in a way that you just, you can't even understand. So thank you. Hello. Good morning. Um, how do you do dedications and how long after someone died? I'm not quite sure what you mean by that. If you can expand on that Union Pacific big boy fan. Um, thank you, guys. Afternoon from England. Hello, Ellie. What is the weirdest request you have gotten? You know, I get asked that a lot. You know, somebody did ask me to bury their loved one naked because that's how they loved them. I thought that was just odd. There's not a lot of odd requests, I think, because we get so many across the full spectrum that there's not too much that's odd anymore. You know, people want to drive their loved ones home in a motor home back to some other state where they want to bury them. Great. We'll lay grandma in the back of the motor home and you can take her home with you back to your other state. Um, you know, there's, it, it's too big of a question because things just to me don't come off as odd where to you, they may be completely off the wall. So it's a really hard question to ask because of that. A certain kind of death. Chris is talking about a documentary called A Certain Kind of Death. Before cremating a body, they cut the body and let blood drain before placing it in the retort. Normal. 
no, that's not normal. I'm going to have to go watch this documentary because I have never heard of it and have no idea why they would be doing that. Awful early, so chatty. It's I've been up for hours, hours. What's water cremation? So water cremation is when the body is placed in water. The water is heated up a little bit. We're not like boiling the person within this water, but the water circulates around and it has lye type chemicals in it that break down the body. So it's basically doing what decomposition does, but speeding it up over the course of seven hours about. And so when the process is done, all the tissue has been liquefied down. You're left with the basic skeletal structure, which is what you're left with with flame cremation as well. Those bones have to dry out a little bit and then they're broken down and turned into the same um, grainy, ashy type material that is cremated remains that you would get back from a flame cremation. So it's a more natural process. It's very, very sterile. Um, it does not take up an environmental footprint from you doing it. So it's it's a really great option for disposition. Is it legal or have you ever been asked to embalm an animal? I have not been asked. Um, we, you know, you can't co-mix humans and animals in a retort when you cremate. Um, it's there's There's got to be some laws against embalming an animal. I do know that there has been embalmers who have talked about that they've embalmed an animal. Um, that's more where you're going to do taxidermy, but you could embalm an animal. You would just need to know the vasculature, you know, where the veins and arteries were in an animal because they do run a little different than a human, obviously. So you could do it. Um, I never have. Um, I'm very sensitive to smells, can have allergic reactions from strong odor, terrified of going to funeral services. You know, there's going to be odors anywhere. A lot, most people, um, have the flower, a flower allergy. So going to a funeral, they react to the flower that are set up around with all the pollen because a lot of lilies are often used and lilies are super strong. I don't smell anything from bodies usually. Um, and if there's an odd odor, I don't know if like a normal person would smell it as opposed to a professional from the funeral industry. Cause we can pick out some of those smells cause we know where they're coming from more, but yeah. Have you finished on the video? No, I haven't Daniel. Um, it's not on here yet. So that's when I need to go back and edit. I haven't had a lot of editing time lately. Um, this last week I, shot three videos with the grave woman and with little miss funeral. And I think those videos are really great because it's almost like a panel of professionals answering questions for you. So I've done a couple videos. We've done some late night videos um, just to get a little more content to put out there. Extreme embalming is only done by very small portion, but they seem to make news because well, it's, you know, just something new for the news. Um, I would imagine there is very high liability and doing that type of embalming. Um, there's a lot of, I'm guessing like rods and poles and things that go into it because a body cannot just stay in that position and you not know that they're going to, you know, fall to the side or do something. So I think there's a lot of positioning mechanisms being used under the closing if clothing, if I had to guess. Um, and in order to have a body pliable to put in those positions, I don't know if you could use even strong fluid or you'd have to use, yeah, I don't know. There's, there's a lot of questions and the people that do it are very tight lipped about things that they use and things that they do to do that. Yeah, Jeremy, that's awesome. So your great grandpa passed and the kids took him from Arkansas to Colorado in the back of his pickup truck. It's awesome. No, you can't smell decay when you drive by a cemetery. The bodies are underground deep enough. You're not going to smell decomposition. Maybe there's a deer out in the field or something that they're smelling. 
Thanks, Mac. Yeah, I really, when I started um, two of the videos that I did with Joelle and Lauren, uh, they took a far turn from where I thought they would. Um, just we did one of talking about music at that funerals. And then we talked about um, some of the scandals within the funeral industry and, you know, getting their input on things was far different than I thought some of their answers would be. And so it was, it's really interesting just living in different areas of the country, our responses and our input on things. So I love it. Later today, I'll be doing a video with the modern mortician talking about some disposition options. I know someone asked last week about body bags. I'm going to hopefully do a video about body bags. I don't know quite all what you want me to talk about with body bags, um, but I'll figure it out. So there are a couple different styles, I guess you would say. Um, so that'll come at some point. I got to gather some body bags to be able to do the video for you. Um, someone asked about the plastic undergarments, if you could make some, make them suctionable. So almost like, you know, like a food saver where you suck the air out and it closes in around the body. Could you do that? Um, I guess theoretically you could maybe use one of those full union alls where the feet are enclosed down to the wrists and you hooked up a vacuum and sucked the air out. However, leaking is still going to be leaking. It's not going to stop. And I think putting pressure in on the body is only going to make it come out more and it's going to find an exit. Fluid finds an exit. And if it can't come out one area, it's eventually going to come nose and mouth. So if it can't get out, you know, the whole, you know, a space down in your leg or your arm or your, your, um, you know, uh, anywhere else, it's going to come out somewhere. So nose and mouth is where it's going to head. And we don't want that either. I had a pre-need meeting today. Your videos made me knowledgeable. My funeral director was wondering how I knew so much. Thank you for your videos. Thanks to you. She won't be embalmed. That's awesome. I do. Do you feel empowered when you go in and you know something to be able to, to advocate for yourself and to know what your rights are. I had a woman telling me that somebody would not give her a price list. And I said, you go in and you tell them nicely. I said, you know, honey, get you more um, bees or whatever that phrase is, you know, let them know that the FTC regulates you must give me a price list. So please provide it for me. And when people hear terms like that, and that means you know your rights, they're going to work with you then. They're going to provide what you need because they know that you're just, you can't be taken advantage of easily. Um, so I think that's awesome. Plastination. I, I don't know that there's a place for it except for like the body exhibit that goes around. Um, it's weird. It's weird. I don't, I don't know. I've never seen a full person like plastinated, if that's even the word. Um, so it's interesting. Do you notice the way people die, the different they smell? I do buy hazard remediation for a job and I noticed overdoses always smell worse than natural caused unattended deaths. You know, there are different smells. It's amazing because, and I've talked about before, in our day and age, we're on so much medication that keeps our body going, even though parts of our body have died. And so you, we may get an individual who just died, like within an hour or two, and they already have a green abdomen, which is uh, one of the first signs of decomposition because their internal is already decomposing before they've died. And so we may get a very fresh person and they are already smelling like decomp because of that. So we deal with that sometimes, not so much cause of death. There are sometimes different things on a body. We can, I can tell a little, maybe what kind of cancer they had or are different little things, or I can take a really educated guess, um, but not so much smells. I, um, yeah, not so much smells. No, you don't have to go in a body bag. A body bag is when you're going to like to the medical examiner office usually um, for an autopsy, then yes, you go in a body bag. But if you're just going to the funeral home, unless that funeral home uses a body pouch, which kind of looks like a body bag, but it's it's not a 
body bag officially. It's more of a pouch style cover for the cot. Um, then you don't. The hardest person I've had to embalm um, emotionally or mechanically, which kind of hard are you thinking? What are the rules or laws <clears throat> to taking someone's cremated remains on a plane overseas? So it depends on the country you're going to. Just like if you were shipping a casketed body, um, same for taking cremated remains, you're going to need the certification of them being cremated remains. You're going to need a death certificate. You may need something from the health department that states, you know, who and what you are taking on the plane, because it's not so much when you leave America, it's when you enter that new country that you have a declaration for your, um, Oh, what's it called? All I can think is the word export. When it's going through customs, when you're going through customs that you need to present and show them what you have. And so they're going to wonder what these cremated remains are and you need to provide the documentation showing who and what that person is. Um, so just have the funeral director check into the laws and the rules of this country you're going to so that you know that you're going to be fine. No, I'm super afraid of death. It does not change for me, my fear or no fear or anything. What do you do to a body that has a skull open during an autopsy? Um, so most autopsy individuals will have their skull open, um, their cranium, and you inject the head as normal during embalming. Um, you pack in the cranium with cotton or some absorbent material because the brain will then, if it wasn't kept by the pathologist, it will be in the bag of all the rest of the viscera that goes in the abdomen. Um, so you fill the cranium with some type of material and you reattach the skull and then you sew up around the head. Um, emotional. So it would probably be my niece. I would, I would wage to say, um, emotionally involving my niece, I would think was the most emotional. Um, can family help with removals? Of course we, if the family's around, we ask if they want to help, you know, many people do, some don't, um, we'll ask the family to help. Do you want to help us move your mom onto the cot? Do you want to help us bring her out to the car and um, kind of help along the way. So Michelle, great question. You're in mortuary school. Can you start your apprenticeship? You need to look at the laws in the state you're doing your apprenticeship and see if it's allowed. So some states do not allow you to do them at the same time because you have to maintain a certain course level for school. And some states require that you are a full-time employee in order to do your apprenticeship and they don't balance together. So you've got to look at the laws of your state, whether or not that's even possible. Some states, I know I just looked at these laws the other day for somebody, you just have to acquire so many hours of an apprenticeship over a period of time. And it can't be more than like, it couldn't be more than like 18 months, I think it was, that you're doing your apprenticeship during, and you just have to get so many hours within that 18 months. So you could do school and your apprenticeship as long as you were getting enough hours in the long haul for it. Somebody asked me the style of clothing you should bring for your loved one if you're bringing clothing to the funeral home. And even if they're being cremated, you can still bring clothing that they're dressed in if you want them cremated in their favorite shirt or a favorite nightgown rather than the hospital gown that they were in you know, at the hospital that they, they died at or something. Um, so clothing, if you're having a viewing, I always recommend long sleeves, a shirt that's not V'd down. That's, you know, a normal rounded collar. If you do a high neck, it looks odd in the casket because it looks really bulky because the person's neck is not elongated. It's flattened out when they're laying down. So their neck is going to look really big and wide. So it's not going to be like this 
beautiful elongated neck, it's going to be a little more like they're, I don't know, they're just going to look bulkier if you bring in a high neck type item. Some situations do denote that you need a high neck shirt, but the funeral director would direct you hopefully in that situation. Um, you know, for men, whatever they would dress in, you don't want to, if somebody, let's say it was a farmer, never dressed up, bring a suit to put them in. If someone wore a suit all the time, every day, you don't want to bring just a basic t-shirt to put them in. So whatever they would most look comfortable to you and most common to you that people would recognize them and um, say, oh, that was her favorite shirt. That was, you know, what she wore to her granddaughter's wedding and such. Bring those type items, bring undergarments, underwear, bras, slips if you want, bring socks, bring shoes if you really want to. You're the only ones who will really know if they're showing unless it's a full couch casket. Um, so bring, you know, covering items and jewelry. So jewelry, hoops and such, you're laying down. So they're not going to be upright like this. They're going to lay funny and you're not going to see them as well. Same with necklaces. Think about gravity. If somebody's laying down, is this really going to stay here? We can pin them, but just think about some of those things. If you're laying down, it definitely is not going to lay the way it would if I'm sitting upright. So dangly earrings are going to hang back. We've got gravity. So studs, um, you know, tighter earrings that stay up by the ear are going to present much better. Uh, Kathy asked last week, she, her mom had died last July, I believe it was. She was 90 years old and her birthday's coming up this month. And she wanted to go to her mom's favorite restaurant and invite some friends and family and just have a nice lunch celebrating her mom and her birthday and just remembering her. And she says, but what if I cry? Then cry, girl, just cry. Um, you know, the price of loving somebody is feeling pain when they've left. That pain gets a little easier with every month and every year that passes. And it's replaced by a soft and warm feeling as you're remembering them, but there's still going to be pain. It doesn't matter if it's 50 years later, you're still going to have some hurt from this person not being around, especially your parents. You've never lived a day in your life without your parents until they've died. Never. They've been there your whole life. So you're going to still be sad. Have a good cry. Have a good cry with your friends. What better group of support having a good cry than with your loved ones because that cry is going to then be followed by some laughter and some memories and some love have the cry can you have a viewing without embalming so it's up to the funeral home whether they allow a public viewing with an unembalmed body because they cannot control what nature is doing with the person um, if they're not embalmed. So that's why funeral homes often require embalming is because they can control color, they can control purging and all sorts of things that are happening with an individual. It's not that it can't be done. It's that a lot of funeral homes are, I guess, nervous because if we put out an individual for viewing that has not been embalmed, we're not controlling a lot of what's happening with them. And Outsiders coming in don't understand and may not know that that person hasn't been involved, embalmed. And if they've never seen an unembalmed individual, they come in and view that person and think, wow, whoever got them ready sucks because they don't realize that we haven't done anything to them to control the color and to control the presentation in the ways we can with embalming. So it's not that we need to charge more money and we need this and we need that. It's because there is a huge perception that we can't control. We can't control judgment from the public. And if they don't know that the individual was not embalmed, that reflects on the funeral home in a certain way. So there's just this area there that hasn't been expanded on quite yet in a lot of areas. And so that's why funeral homes require it most of the time. I haven't got my pumpkin fix, Sherry. I need to get a Dremel 
tool that's for the next step up. It's sitting in the corner. I'm looking at it right now and I need to just circle back to it. I think in the next week, my goal is to make my office more Zen. If you guys saw what a crazy crap shoot my office is right now, it's just a disaster. It doesn't, it's not conducive for good, powerful work right now. So I need to revamp this space to make it better for shooting videos, for doing work in and for getting some things done. So I need to focus on it because I haven't yet and I need to. So that's a great question. That gives me a kick in the butt, Sherry. So I need to get my space in order to get some good stuff done. I love that, Chris, that your grandma wanted some wool socks when she was buried. I am one that I always put at least socks on an individual. So if there's nice, clean socks in the prep room and they didn't bring clean socks for the person, I cannot bury someone with just naked feet because my feet are always cold and it's just a mental thing. I like to have something on the person's feet. Do funeral homes do tours? Great question as well. Yes, they do. Especially if you want to use the facility, ask to tour around, ask to see the, the areas. And if there's a deceased in an area, they can't really show it to you, but you can see the rest of the facility and the rest of the business. My Christian life is asking, uh, is saying his daughter's been asking about funerals and his daughter got a tour. Oh, awesome. How old's your daughter that watches with you? Yes, I, I agree. Um, Mizzy Dizzy, if that's how you pronounce the name, some of your name, some of the like names for, uh, like your logins. It's so, I, I have no idea where they stem from and it's kind of interesting, but I think it is, I, we're moving to, you know, more natural viewing and, and things like that. But in certain areas of the country, it is not normal. It is not seen yet. Um, so like where I am, middle America, it's not a, as natural for people to have a viewing without embalming. And so it would reflect badly. And you look at some of these situations. It's so funny. We just talked about this in my thing with Lauren and Joelle. When people are not prepared for a viewing, that's not like they've always traditionally seen in a casket, embalmed, dressed in a certain way, you know, different, different scenarios. They walk into a situation and they judge it poorly. And that is when photos are taken and they're shared on social media and the funeral homes blasted and people start screaming about lawsuits and illegal activity because they don't realize that the family chose this. The family wanted that. That's something the family wanted done. And that's where some of these stories and these snowball effects come from is because people jump to conclusions without knowing the information. And it really is hard because we as funeral directors and funeral homes can't fight that. Once that bad media and that bad stories out there about us, we're really at the mercy of it because no matter what we say, it doesn't change what was put out there initially. And it's a lot of times by family members who are not even at the core making decisions, or it's a friend that wants to just jump on something and put it out there. It gets really ugly and it's really hurtful to the industry, to the funeral director, to the family, then who is at the center of the stories. So there's some, there's some trickiness there that over time it's going to get better, but it takes a long time to uh, make changes. Hey, Chloe. Also, hi to you. Uh, Mac, the candles, the candles here, my candles. Oh, 11. Oh, January 28th is my parents, uh, my brother's birthday as well. The candles warm the room up. Mm, I also love the candles. Oh, my candles. See, it's just over here. I didn't light it today. I don't know why. And I'm going to get some candles. I took a course on death and dying in high school and we toured a funeral home. The whole class was fascinating. You know, it's part of um, like home economics and things that used to be around in schools. They would do the birth, you know, life, getting through marriage, balancing checkbooks, cooking, all that. And part of it was funeral homes and uh, talking about death. And they've gotten rid of a lot of those classes. 
Uh, I've reached out to a lot of schools saying, hey, if you have career days or you want me to come talk about funerals and nobody has ever taken me up on it. So uh, students, just like a lot of areas, are entering into the world unprepared in a lot of areas. Can I shadow a director without an apprenticeship? It depends on the laws in your state, and it depends on the funeral director. Some are open and allow you to see and do a little more than others. So it really depends. Um, just ask. That's all you got to do is just ask. I got to do a job shadow. It was my dad. So they let me watch the embalming and I got to help dress and casket him it was an amazing experience. If you could handle that, you were good to go. I think that's so special JW that you got to do that and, and help with your dad and be there for him. And you're right. If you can handle that big of a mountain, anything less you should be able to do. How to jump off for a bit. Can family members transport an unembalmed body to the body farm with paperwork? Of course. Um, if the body farm is going to accept the individual um, and as long as the state lines you're crossing, allow it. So every state has a law whether you can bring an unembalmed body into that state or not. So you would have to check every state you would pass through on the way whether you can do bring an unembalmed body or not. So um, there's laws and you have to follow them. So whether your path has to be a little bit longer to avoid a certain state um, you would have to just check into that. And your funeral director could help you do that as well. Um, Sexy Mexi, which is fun to say as a name, asked me one more question from last week that I wanted to comment on. Um, he said there was a young woman in his area that was killed that was pregnant. She, I think he said, he or she said eight months pregnant and wondered about embalming. I've done a video on this, but it is a gray area. It's all up to the pathologist, the funeral home, the family, whether the baby is removed or not. Typically, if the person has an autopsy, that baby is removed during the autopsy because abdomen and everything is opened up. So the baby will be removed. If there's no autopsy, then that baby is still in utero. That is up to the family if you want the baby removed or not. Um, so it's not so much that the funeral director decides kind of what to do. It's that the family may need to make the decision or the decision is made during the autopsy if the baby is brought out or not. Some families choose that they want the baby, you know, embalmed and shown along with the mother. Sometimes the baby is just embalmed and um, placed in maybe with, at the foot of the mom and then tucked in the arms for burial. If they don't want to do a viewing of the baby, literally every situation is going to be different. And it is a case by case scenario when it comes to a woman who dies, who was pregnant. So no straight answer to that. Absolutely not. Um, it's all case by case. Oh, I'm so sorry, Ellie, you didn't get to see your dad. Um, 15, you are I'm, I'm a believer every age should be involved and get to see and do. And um, definitely at 15, you needed that um, at least to hold his hand. You know, if there was trauma, depending how he had killed himself, if there was trauma to his face or something, you could at least have held his hand and seen his hand and got to have your moment. That's I'm really sad for you that you didn't get that. And hello from Nova Scotia. Okay, one last. How many funeral homes do you work for, Carrie? Are you always on call with all of them? So it's kind of ebbs and flows. I'm on schedule with one consistently that I help them on a regular schedule for the most part. Um, I have another that I do some extended coverage for when they do vacations. Um, I have a couple that call me for trade embalming. So it depends. I may have a month where I don't get called by any of them, or I may have a month where I get called by three, four, whoever, you know, who knows. Um, that's the thing about freelance and trade work is there is a huge ebb and flow. A funeral home may go through a period where they're super busy or where they lose an employee and they just need some extra help for a while, or they may go through a period where they're slow, they're fully staffed, they don't need anybody. So it is an ebb and flow. So it's not for everybody. You've got to really be able to balance your finances to understand that some months you're going to be making a lot, some months not so much. And you have to be able to balance that. 
Not everybody can do that. It's also a contract position. So they do not take taxes out. So I have to hold money aside for taxes every year because I'm a contract work. So that's a 1099 type situation. So it's very different because you are more in control of what's happening. And that is really not for some people. Um, There's people who can't manage their funds, can't hold aside money for taxes that they're going to have to pay a chunk into at the end of the year. Not for everybody, but definitely doable, obviously. Well, thank you guys um, so much. I I really just, I love that I started this coffee with Carrie. I like answering these questions in the moment and with you. And I do go back and see if anybody posts because the live chat stream is gone. Once this video is done, you then have to post a question and comments for me to bring it back to answer next week. That's how it kind of works. So the live chat is not there for me to um, scroll through and to pull questions from. And you can't leave questions thereafter. So if you really want a question answered, drop it in the comments below and I will check and answer it in next week's videos. Thank you guys so much for joining, for being here with me. I really appreciate it. And we'll be back next Wednesday with another Coffee with Carrie. Bye guys.